Hello, everybody. Wow, wow. One week <sighs> from today, I will give a TED talk about feelings like this. <sighs> China. I know what you're all wondering, where did all of the hair go? <laughs> but I do think this video describes me really well. And somebody I would actually like to talk about is my father. Uh, his name was Luke and he was born in a small town in Ireland and his father was a mechanic and his grandfather was a mechanic so naturally he became a mechanic too. My mother was born in a small farming town in Ireland and she was one of nine children and she graduated high school with great grades but she couldn't afford to go to university so she became a nurse instead. And when my mother finished her training she was offered a job in Sudan delivering babies and when my father finished his apprenticeship he was offered a job in Sudan uh, teaching mechanics and they were actually placed into the same accommodation and they fell in love and they moved back to Ireland and decided it was too cold so they moved to Australia and they were fruitful. <laughs> Yeah, and my parents and I have always shared this sense that we need to explore, which is why I'd like to ask you this question. How many times have you had the feeling that you just need to run away? <laughs> A lot, right? And when I say it, I'm not saying to escape, but because you just need to explore, because you need to like look like James Bond or Indiana Jones and just see the world or something. Well, let me tell you, I felt like this every single day during high school. And in Australia, it's quite common when you finish high school to take something called a gap year. And it's just one year, you can take it off and you can do whatever you want. And some people get internships or full-time jobs or watch Netflix for 52 days. <laughs> and I belong to a small cohort that chose to travel. And for me, running away was the dream and the gap year was the opportunity. So I worked for a few months making beds in a hotel and then I caught the cheapest possible flight I could to Amsterdam. And I was with my friend Chloe and Chloe and I travelled down through Brussels and then to Paris where I got this great photo and then to Nice. And in Nice I said goodbye to Chloe and I started travelling by myself. And I caught a bus to Barcelona and it was the first time I'd ever been solo travelling and it may have been the most lucid week of my life. Every night I partied until 6am and I'd wake up at 3pm and I'd maybe see one site and get dinner before I was partying again. And it kept happening. And I know it seems very cosmetic and plastic, but it was maybe the best week of my life. And I, re <laughs> and I remember meeting this guy called Giuseppe. He was this weird Italian guy. And he said, Peter, you're in Spain during summer. You have to run with the bulls or you'll regret it. So I caught a bus to a place called Zaragoza, which is halfway to Pamplona, where people have the opportunity run, to run with the bulls. And it was 40 degrees outside, like it was boiling hot. And you should understand that all of the accommodation in Pamplona for running of the bulls is booked out months in advance. So my plan was to leave my backpack in Zaragoza and just travel to Pamplona for a couple of nights and maybe sleep in the parks. And at the time, it seemed pretty clever. I, like, it seemed like a great idea. So I traveled to Pamplona, and I remember uh, stepping off the bus and just seeing black clouds coating the horizon. And I was like, oh shit, like, this, is, this is not good. And I felt cold. I was wearing a white t-shirt and black shorts, and it was raining. And my shirt was transparent, everybody could see my nipples, and I just felt, I just felt vulnerable. <laughs> and because it was raining, I couldn't sleep in the parks like I had planned to, and I made friends with these Texan students, and we slept under this concrete awning at a hotel. And I remember lying on the cold concrete thinking that there was no place in the world I would rather be than back in my bed in Australia, cuddled up under some warm blankets. And it was just incredibly painful, and my legs were just going numb. And at one stage, I chose to stand up and walk around the block, which is where I found this kebab store. And I ate a significant number of kebabs before the owner told me, told me that he was closing and that I'd need to leave, which is when I made this video. Hello. So we've been trying to fall asleep, but... It's freezing cold, and I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. Then he gave me this cardboard box. 
So hopefully that's enough to keep me warm when I get back. I guess you'll find out if I don't make it through the morning. Mum and Dad, I love you. Ugh. See, and see, one side of my brain when I look at this says, oh my God, like you actually thought you were going to die. And then the other side of my brain says, oh my God, you actually thought you were going to die. Like, <laughs> I was terrified and I was in like a lot of pain. And what's so crazy is that the next morning, the next day was one of the best of my life. I ran with the bulls, I woke up to the music of Spain, and everywhere I looked, people were smiling and drinking sangria. It was fantastic. And I ran with the bulls, and I remember you could see them pass you, and you would just get the biggest rush of adrenaline running through your body. And when you finish the running of the bulls, you end up in this arena, this giant circle. And I rem remember I magically found my friend Giuseppe. He was the one that had told me that I needed to run with the bulls. And I remember looking him in the eye and saying, thank you for making me do this. Faster than ever before, my life had transitioned from a state of pain and sorrow to a state of pure ecstasy. And that was something that really shocked me. And I remember I travelled from Pamplona back to Zaragoza to get my bag, and then I went to Madrid, and then I flew to Dublin, where my family was at the time. And my mother, the nurse, told me how stupid I was, and she made me sit in a bathtub for like four hours until, <laughs> until she thought I was healthy again. And then I went fishing with my uncle and caught this fish. Pretty good, right? <laughs> I thought this would be my most impressive slide. Anyway, from there, one month later, I traveled to France. In high school, I had heard about this thing called El Camino de Santiago, this giant hike, and you start in France, and for 30 days you walk, staying in different hiking hostels. And I was just walking towards the west coast of Spain for 30 days. But I remember stepping off the bus on the first day. A lot of my stories <laughs> start like that. And I saw this Polish guy with no hair, and he was decked out in hiking attire. And we just both magically knew we'd be doing the hike together. And I was like, Camino, Camino, hey! And we were, we were best friends. So I paired up with this weird Polish guy. And we were walking up the first mountain out of the town and we met an Austrian guy who offered us bananas, so we called him Austria. And then at the top of the mountains, we met these two German girls who were wearing identical outfits because they had gone shopping together, <laughs> which was pretty nice. And the five of us became a family, and we walked together for the next 30 days. And I don't think I've ever felt closer to anybody but these four people. But I remember on day five, I was on my, on my phone scrolling through Facebook, and I read that a friend from back home had died. And that hit me really hard. She wasn't a best friend, nor was she a close friend, but she was just a really cool chick. <laughs> and it, like, it really hurt, because the friends that I wanted to talk to, the ones that knew my friend Astrid, were on the other side of the world. And the people that I was with, the people that were willing to talk to me, they didn't know her, they didn't know the way she smiled. And never before have I felt that alone, like I had nobody to talk to. And 25 days later, I walked into Santiago and I made this status on Facebook. I said, I did it, 800 kilometers on foot, one million steps, life is good. And all of my friends were liking it and commenting, congratulating me, and I felt really cool. And I remember my friend's dad, who was like a second father to me, commented and he said, Peter, you've done something huge. And I felt that I had. I was an 18-year-old kid on the other side of the world walking across Europe. It, was, it felt badass. And I remember from Santiago, I walked on to a place called Finisterra. And in Finisterra, traditionally, you burn things that caused you burden on your hike. And most people burn their boots because they got blisters and things like this. And I wanted to burn my hat because it had never really protected me from the sun, but I forgot to bring it to the bonfire, so I burnt my underwear instead, because it was the, it was the only thing I was really willing to sacrifice. But on this trip, I really felt that I was building this raw emotional intelligence, and I was learning what mattered to me and what I could filter out. Uh, I traveled down to Porto, where I met a girl called Lydia, and traveled with her for a few days to Lisbon, and then I flew to London, where I met my friend Sam. And Sam was a friend from high school, and he had told me on the phone that he was coming to Europe, and I was just so incredibly excited. And this is the first photo we got together, which I really like. That's us in front of Buckingham Palace. And I said, Sam, I've been here for months. You've got two months. What do you want to do? And he said, I want to see what's in Greece. 
So we mapped this out and we traveled basically along this line down to Greece on buses and trains. It was lovely and we partied in Amsterdam and we saw one of Sam's favorite rappers in Berlin and we ate horse in Slovenia and we jumped off this huge weird bridge in Bosnia. <laughs> Now I just want to dance. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we got to Greece and we didn't have enough time to make it back, back on buses or trains. So instead we flew to Rome. And in Rome I looked on Skyscanner and I saw dirt cheap flights to Egypt. And I looked at Sam and I was like, Sam, we have to get photos in front of the pyramids. Like, we can't not do this. Uh, so we booked these flights and I called my parents. They told me I was stupid. And we called Sam's mum and dad, both military personnel. And uh, Sam's dad, like, forbade us from going. He said, like, there's no way you'll go. You'll get yourself killed. And he offered to pay us money not to go. It was, like, pretty awkward for me. And I'm an incredibly stubborn person, so one week later we got this photo in Egypt. <laughs> and my friend Sam took this, and I'm sitting in front of the oldest pyramid in the world. And it was, in, it was under construction at the time, and there was no security, so we were able to climb underneath it. And it, it was just incredible, and it was one of the highlights of my trip. And looking back at the whole gap year experience, I could tell that my life had changed a lot. Back in Australia, I think I lived a very normal life. I had happy days and I had sad days just like everybody else. In Europe and while traveling I felt that my emotions had been amplified. The happy days felt like pure ecstasy and the bad days like they sucked. Like it felt like I had been punched in the face. It was horrible. And it was something that I very much identify as occurring during this gap year when I really stepped out of my element. It was something very special to me. And I quickly realised that all that mattered to me were these special moments, the ones you've seen. Uh, finishing the Camino, sitting in front of the pyramids, jumping from bridges. They were the ones that liberated me and I just had to learn to ignore everything else. And back in Australia I kept travelling. I would do trips during my university breaks all over the place. And I remember waking up in bed one night and I was coughing blood all over my white sheets. And my mother, the nurse, rushed me to hospital and the doctor said, Peter, you have two blood clots in your lungs. And again, I was like, ah, oh, shit, this, <laughs> this can't be good. Uh, and I remember the doctor sat me down and he said, Peter, you're not invincible. And remember how I told you I was really stubborn? Uh, that night I booked flights to Indonesia. <laughs> and I had one of the most special trips of my life. I rode a motorbike from Bali to Jakarta, and I did it without a smartphone, I should add. Not by choice, it just broke on the first day, and I was, <laughs> and I was left just chasing the sun west. But I had a really special trip, and I wanted to come and give this TED talk today, and I wanted to be able to give you some sort of advice. Because I don't want to just say that I've, I've had the perfect life, because it's been good and it's been bad. But the one piece of advice I'd like to give you is to find an outlet that makes your emotions feel stronger and just chase those peaks. And for me it was travel, but for people I've known it's been photography or music or art or even cycling. Just do something that makes you feel great and just chase those moments that make you feel like you're on top of the world. <sighs> my conclusion is written horribly on my arm. But first, I should read you this quote from Van Gogh. He said, Normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk, but no flowers grow on it. <laughs> the reason I still feel like I'm winning is because one day in Europe, I decided that all that mattered to me was creating these special moments. I consider myself an incredibly happy person, and I attribute that solely to the fact that every venture I go on has to be the best, the best one I've done so far. I think, better check. <laughs>
I think I've had some really, really tough nights and some tough hits, and nights where I think I've absolutely hated myself. But I'd still pick it every single time because it means chasing the highest peaks, drinking sangria with strangers, and jumping from heights that absolutely terrify me. So once again, chase the peaks and ignore everything else. Thank you so very much.